it's Saturday morning and you're still conscious. Well done. Um, this one is billed as Grill the Committee. Here's the committee. And there's more of you than there are of us, which is always a good thing. In fact, I was sport for choice. As you might know, if you know who's on the committee, um, there are more than this number of members of the WG21 C++ Standards Committee uh, here at this conference. So these are the people that I picked because they happen to be around, or I thought looking at the various sections we've got in WG21, it would fill in a gap and kind of cover as much as I could of, of the whole kind of range of things that we do in WG21. Um, so what I thought we might do, I'm sure that some of you know some of the people in this group, but few of you know everybody. So I thought the first thing we'd start with is just going down the line and people can say um, who they are um, and why they're on WG21. They were bad in a previous life. Um, and anything else they'd like to say about the bits that they get involved with in WG21. Sound fair? Makes sense? Before I do that, you will have noticed several things possibly about this group of people. We're all from a sort of similar ethnic and gender background. <laughs> <coughs> Which is a shame. And age range. And age range, yeah. So there's really just one of us here. We just cloned a few times, and some of us have shaved more recently. Um, I did try quite hard to get the one candidate woman who's here to sit with us, but she didn't want to. So we're all men, which is a shame. But that actually reflects WG21, where typically there's 100 and something people get together and three, four women. So if you know any women that want to get involved in standardizing C++, please encourage them to turn up. We do our best to be very friendly and welcoming, and as far as I'm aware, it's not an issue. It just seems to be hard to persuade people to join, and we can't make people into women. That would be difficult. Yeah, yes, <laughs> we're friendly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'll start, because I'm holding the mic, although there's another one. Uh, I'm Roger, Roger Orr. Um, I've been on WG21 for a few years, six or seven years, um, and I am the sort of chair of the BSI, the UK C++ panel. Um, so I spend a certain amount of time just dealing with the administrivia that has to be dealt with. Uh, when I go to the standards meeting, I tend to spend most of my time sitting in the core language bit where not a lot is said sometimes, but people are thinking very, very hard. I'm Herb Sutter. I, I am involved in C++ standardization, a lot of administrivia, as you are. Yep. And thank you very much, Roger, for all that you've done and the other, the other uh, ones, including some here who represent countries and, and heads of delegation. Um, I tend to spend most of my time at meetings in evolution, in the evolution working group, new language extensions. Hello, I'm Guy Davidson. I've been involving myself with the committee for a couple of years now, mainly in SG14. Uh, although more recently I've started lurking on SG13 and involving myself with the 2D API. Uh, if anybody came to my talk on Thursday, you'll have seen all the stuff that I've been doing. Uh, I'm wearing this t-shirt because I recently took a pledge not to serve on all male panels without at least drawing attention to it. <laughs> and besides, it's from a good movie. Uh, my name is Marshall Clough. I work for Qualcomm, and um, I tend to hang out. I've, I've been a member of the, the Standards Committee for five years, six years, something like that. And um, I tend to hide out in the library working group, um, which concerns itself with the, the back two-thirds of the standard. I'm Deep Naku. I go to the committee meeting since about 20 years. Um, I normally lurk in uh, the library working group. I do have some interest in numeric and theory. I would like to get uh, decimal floating point standardized, for example. Um, and yeah, mostly it's library. But, yeah. I'm jo Jonathan Caves. I'm from uh, Microsoft. I've been, my first committee meeting was probably 95, and I've been off and on the committee since then. Uh, I deal with the core, obviously, I run a comp compiler team. Um, so I just sit, sit and be very quiet and I, I pretend I'm think, thinking. 
I'm uh, Daniel Garcia. I'm the head of a delegation from Spain in the C++ committee, and um, I've been in the committee for the last, I think in the last 10 years, I only missed one meeting. And uh, most of my time I spent in the evolution working group with some time uh, making short trips to the concurrency working group. I'm Peter Sommerlat. I'm also almost 10 years on the committee. And actually ACCU is guilty that I'm <laughs> there because I attended a, a workshop by Alistair Meredith at one of my first ACCUs, and then I ask a lot of interesting questions, as you might have uh, heard me asking other people interesting questions, guy. <laughs> and that uh, meant that uh, he told me, well, people asking those questions should be on the committee. And today I spend a lot of my time in the library evolution working group, and uh, usually my proposals that I try to get through are for things everybody would like to have, but they more or less got forgotten or fell in the gaps, like RAII support in the standard library, which we didn't get, unfortunately, for 17 yet. But stay tuned for 20. Thank you. Right, that's a bit of an introduction. Now, it's over to you guys. I'm hoping you've got some good questions, and I'm sure being accu that there will be people who have questions. Who would like to start? It could be a very short <laughs> session, couldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone got a question? Who understood everything that people said? Ah, question. Good. I noticed that priority queue, queue, and stack don't have a uh, clear as a method. Why not? Because it could call the underlying stack, the uh, underlying clear for whatever container is used. It would be far easier to call that than have to perpetuate saying are we empty if not pop etc I think the simple answer is the these three adapters are kind of unloved children nobody really cares much about them in the committee nobody wrote proposals against them as far as I know and I think that is the main reason they basically fell a little bit by the wayside one of the things uh, the committee works, it doesn't do anything on itself. Basically, everybody, uh, any change done is done out of the interest of somebody willing to write a proposal to change something. They don't have to be on the committee. Um, mostly, if you want to have actually have an interest and you do not go, it helps to find a sponsor, but without anybody writing a proposal and ideally somebody kind of uh, Moving it, nothing changes. And I think the uh, stack queue and priority queue are perceived as not being used much and don't get much love correspondingly. Does that align? Yeah, that's a, that's a good summary. And and I was trying to think of if there were if I could remember any historical reason why there wasn't a clear, and I'm I'm not coming up with any. So I suspect it was overlooked when they were proposed many years ago and nobody has felt strongly enough to write a paper proposing that additional functionality. Procedural, what you might do to get something started, uh, file a library issue that this is missing. And then some people like Marshall might take care of that or maybe even I might write a little paper on that. Because I'm, I'm kind of the, the janitor cleaning things up. <laughs> <laughs> the writing proposals is a very good idea. If you write a proposal, there is a section which says proposed wording. Even if you do not get that right, uh, write proposed wording, strong recommendation. Typically, we do not have the time to write proposed wording in the meeting. And typically, we look at issues and say, yeah, that makes sense. And we classify them as lower priority if they do not have proposed resolution. Just saying. Um, I, would, I would like to actually push back a little bit about the thing about filing an issue. Um, we, we don't tend to add features as the result of issues. Issues are for defects. And so 
Um, things, that people who file issues that asking for new functionality, they tend to get kind of shuffled off to the side because until somebody writes a paper. <laughs> so if you have new functionality, and this is a very small piece of new functionality, it could probably be dealt with with a one-page paper. How do you submit a paper? ISOCPP.org, go to standardization tab, and there's how to submit a proposal and how to file an issue. Um, when you write a paper, even if it's one page, please start with motivation. Here is the code I want to write and workarounds I have today, what I would like to write and how it solves the problem, and then what the proposal is. Because for example, saying there should be an empty is fine, but it's not enough. There should be, and here is what it should do. It should be implemented in terms of dot empty on the underlying, or even something simple like that, it, th that's close to compilable, then we actually have something concrete. Thank you in advance for your proposal. <laughs> <laughs> I would also encourage you to make a proposal and remind everybody that to make unique turned up quite a long time after make shared. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was that your full question or do you have other? Okay. We'll come back to you in a, in a minute then, to live. Timo. I actually have two questions, but this one actually fits the question just discussed. So if you are writing a paper um, and you have an idea, but you have zero experience with writing actual wording, uh, what would you recommend to do? Like on that page I mentioned, uh, it includes where to float the idea, so put it on the SCD-proposals forum first. Many committee members hang out there. You will both get initial feedback and you'll see who bit and who could be um, asked to help with wording. Could you just re repeat, like where would you post that? ISLCPP.org, ah, yeah. look at the standardization tab, which goes to slash STD, and there's several pages there, one of which is how to submit a proposal, and it has instructions including the forum I just mentioned. You may also, although he does, uh, attend the uh, BSI meetings where you will find other people who do attend the uh, committee and uh, do have ideas how uh, papers should look like and talk to them and find a collaborator over there. That has the added advantage that if you find a collaborator directly who actually attends the meeting, that you have also somebody who is actually f uh, shepherding things through, hopefully. Uh, my first paper is still in flight. Um, I didn't, it's, <laughs> yeah, my first paper is still in flight. I simply made the proposal, I was lurking on SG14, and I didn't know what to do, and people flooded to help. And actually, we are a very helpful community, it turns out. So just start and see if anybody wants to join in. That's my recommendation. I also want to point out that it is not uncommon for proposals to go through several revisions. Um, it is, matter of fact, very uncommon for a proposal to be accepted right off the bat, even from people who have been writing papers f for several years. Um, what usually happens is you, you make a revision one, and it gets presented at a meeting, and people say, well, yeah, that's kind of nice, but what about this, or this, or yeah, this, this part of it here is, is not quite right. And then you come back with revision two, and everybody says, oh yeah, that's much better, but now this, this doesn't match. And you come back with revision three. Um, yeah, guy said he's on revision five. Um, my first major piece of, of, of work for the standard went through four revisions before it was accepted. Just be patient and persistent. <laughs> RAII, so simple as it sounds, is I believe now in revision eight. What are you doing wrong? <laughs> What's that? What are you doing wrong? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a topic everybody cares about on the Library Evolution Working Group, and therefore, each time it comes up, somebody cares even more about it. <laughs> Adding uh, <coughs> using declarations to attributes, which was a very tiny, tiny, tiny thing, it required four revisions of the paper. But that's four. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> and don't scare people too badly. Yeah. Right. Um, I think recently uh, there was a free function added to the library, std empty, uh, to test whether a container is empty. Um, in the Qt development and uh, community, empty is kind of seen as a verb. And so if you would call empty on a container, people would say, well, that's going to clear the container, um, make it empty. Uh, so we use is empty. And so I'm, my question is, uh, when std empty was being proposed and discussed, was there ever any, anyone to say, well, this should be called is empty? I mean, I can imagine that you would say, well, we want to be consistent with the member functions on the containers, but mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there was any other consideration. I mean, that was, that was the consideration, is to, to, to test if a container is empty, you call container dot, you know, container dot empty. If you want to clear it, you call container dot clear, and that's what the entire standard library uses, and the free functions are going to match that rather than anybody else, <laughs> I, the rest of the world. Did we I, I want no, you can change the containers easily, but uh, just to give you an example, who is considering consistency and using empty as the free function name here in this room? Raise your hand. <laughs> empty, just empty. empty. What we get? Empty is which? As a, as a, as a question or as a verb? As a question, as a question, as a question, like it is today. So we have about a couple of hands. Who thinks that is empty would have been a much better way, even considering that it's inconsistent with the API of the containers? Okay. You see, that's how things work out in the standards committee. We do a lot of things that is nicknamed bike shedding names. And those are actually the times uh, the worst times in my life because it goes around in circles from meeting to meeting sometimes, so I have to uh, blame myself for doing things like that. So it's not only, I'm not only the, the um, I'm one of the changers and one of the, uh, how do you say that? Of, uh, so yeah, I think the short answer is to be cons consistent with the member, fu member functions on the containers. That was, that was how the name was chosen. Peter, I was just about to say that the correct term now is bite shedding. The C++ uh, 17 has a new feature called std bite. Uh, it's a way for really that static an analysis tools can know that this is a memory. It's not really a char because you normally use un unsigned char. The biggest problem of std byte was the name. And it went round and around and around and around. And we finally got back to where we, start, we started with, with std byte. Those of you who are on Twitter and I am occasionally, that's why I asked on Twitter, thank you for voting. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Um, this isn't really a proper grill, but um, how much of the committee's time is, is um, uh, spent dealing with um, new features interacting unexpectedly with each other? Um, and, uh, how long, uh, and how long can this go unnoticed, uh, that two features uh, interact badly with each other? Not enough, and it's really, really hard. <laughs> uh, we have some... The number of people on the committee who can actually hold the whole standard in their head at one time is very, very few. Zero. 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 <laughs> well, there's Jens. No. No, I mean, yeah. And so, the, yeah, I mean, writing a compi compi com compiler, you quickly realize that the, the, the interesting stuff happens at the boundaries between two, two, two features. They don't, um, people just don't think about, about it. And um, I mean, that's one of the things where you co proposals come to core, you'll tend to find, find people asking que que questions, <laughs> what about this? And they say, oh, didn't think about that, or no. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a, pro a problem, and it comes, I think it comes mostly from how, just how big the, la the, la the language has, got, has gotten. 
Of course, if you were standardizing existing practice where people tried these things out for a serious amount of time, we would not have that problem as much. However, uh, standardization of existing practice is roughly speaking what never happens. That's a bit. That's a bit strong. It's not like it's not like we never do that. Uh, ha having said that, uh, in fact, all of the C plus plus seventeen features and all of the TS features I can think of off the top of my head have existing implementations of at least most of them, if not all of them. Sometimes multiple implementations. So we're getting better at that. Um, having said that, yeah, sometimes you only discover things after things have been out in the field for a while. Um, in integration testing can go on for a long time. Having said that. I, th I think that I'm not being overly optimistic in saying that when we find those, the, by the time that we ship the standard, they are generally edge cases that people find rarely. There are, there are a few that it's like, oh wow, how did that get through? But there aren't that many of those. The common cases are, are well debugged and you know, any language is gonna have dark corners and interactions. We are a rich language, but I think we're actually doing not bad a job at that. Having said that, as soon as I say that, we will discover another one, so I've probably just jinxed it right there. Um. One of the reasons why it is a bit of a problem, uh, and it's bound to be, it's not that we're doing anything wrong, is the way the, the process works, and I'm not sure how many people know kind of some of the words we've been bandying about. So we, we split the standard effectively into two halves. There's the language bit and the library bit. And we correspondingly split the committee up into sort of two halves, the language bit and the library bit. Not hard and fast boundaries, but, but... And then we have each of those halves is split into two, with the evolution part looking at new things and changes and proposals, and then the people that do the really hard core wording or the library wording to get it down into the, into the standard. So a lot of proposals come in to library evolution, go through to library and are done, and they just affect library wording, and there's not much interaction with the language, some. The harder ones are where someone proposes a change to the language. So it goes to evolution and they talk about it, <coughs> and then eventually some formal wording is proposed to core, and it often goes back and forth between core and evolution quite a few times. And it's not till you get the final agreed wording out of the bottom of core that anybody in library really can play with it because you haven't got a compiler, and it's very hard to try and compile things in your head, I find, and remain sane. But, um, and, and then we discover that there's an interaction with the library that nobody noticed because we didn't think of it or we didn't, weren't aware there was going to be an issue. And then library have to say, well, hang about, we've got all these library clauses that were written way before this thing was even a twinkle in the eye of the proposer and they're not compatible with it. Well, that's not surprising. We haven't yet invented the time machine. It's on my list. Um, and then library have to say, well, okay, now you've got this wording, but it actually breaks things in a, in a really nasty fashion. Um, how do we fix it? Do we have to push it back to evolution and core to change the design, or can we make changes in library? Um, so that's why some things are found quite late in the day. Because although the idea has been around for a long time in evolution, it's not till you get the final wording that some of these edge cases really fall out. Wording or implementations. Yeah. Uh, Dan, you want to uh, while all of what Roger uh, said is qu uh, quite true, we try to improve. For example, some of you were yesterday in my talk about uh, context programming. So context uh, programming just now passed uh, evolution, and we decided that before going to core for so and they change everything. Before, before that, we will go to library evolution so that we check that what we are proposing is good for library, and then we will go to core. So sometimes we try to do that, not always, but sometimes. Who's next? Yeah. Um, maybe a bit dumb question. Uh, can you share some insights on how it's going with modules and coroutines? I mean, yeah, I think that's <laughs> my question. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so both of those are currently 
uh, on track to become a technical specification first, which is a side document separate from the standard. Think of it as a beta branch that by default TSs are expected to be merged into trunk, but we want to get more experience with them. Uh, Coroutines was just sent out. It is, as we speak, in its, it, its one and only comment ballot. So assuming this ballot succeeds, we'll resolve comments and publish it. So the beta will be, is, is expected to be published this year, and then we can talk about merging it into the uh, draft C++20 uh, trunk that we're opening in, uh, in Toronto. Modules came achingly close to the being in the same position right now at the last meeting. We expect it to be one meeting behind and do that in the next meeting, we hope. You can never predict for sure, but that's the expectation. I've actually got a question for um, everybody out there. How many people have actually had a play with the new stuff that turns up in the, you know, in the Visual Studio compiler? We, uh, you've switched on um, some of the new features on command lines. Does anyone here make it their business to experiment with them, besides all of us here? Okay. Sorry, can I get some hands? <laughs> so it's about a quarter of the room. Okay, thanks. My question has to do with uh, standardizing existing practice um, and library features. Uh, what do you think the place of boost is, um, and the yeah? What do you think the place of boost is, and the relationship with TSs, and um, let's say, do you think that boost should play more of a of a um, um, incubator role? than it does right now, or you think that we should use TSs to merge uh, new library features, or? Wow, that's a several beer question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Um, Boost has, has, has a long history of providing new library features for the standard, um, stretching back to TR1, which was what, 2005, and continuing on into 2017 with optional and variant and any, which, you know, had their genesis in Boost back in like 2001. Um, I like getting things from Boost, because um, I've written some of them, <laughs> but, but no, but besides that, but because, um, because Boost has a large user base and, you know, peop people in Boost are quite willing to explore various design options and try different things and, and get to the, gather a lot of field experience, and that's important. Um, I don't see that, that having TSs and taking things from Boost uh, are ex mutually exclusive. They're different paths, or sometimes things go f could go from, well, some things went from Boost through a TS into the standard, like the searcher stuff. File systems. Or file system, mm -hmm. yeah. It's just to name two. Um, so, um, I don't know if that really answers your question. Uh, let me actually ask a question. Um, do you think that we should try to enforce uh, more field experience through something like uh, either a TS that is widely available or Boost in order to actually standardize existing practice as opposed to doing what we sometimes do? Every time we vote out a standard, we pretty much go, actually, we need an implementation for that. And every time somebody proposes a feature which is somehow not having experience, they go, oh, yeah, but we have it implemented, and it's used somewhere, and people really need it and want it. And every time, that doesn't really work out. Boost was originally created, actually, generally, back in uh, 1998 at the, um, it was basically kicked off at the, uh, right after we standardized uh, the original C++ to basically say we want to ta have a uh, public available playground where people have used features and we standardize things which actually have used, mm -hmm. have been used. That is why it was created. Um, and I think it should, things should have, 
at least an implementation on the user base. Whether Boost is the only one, certainly it will not be the only one. Other places implement things as well. But I think things shall be implemented, but basically the way the process works is you have a group of people, this includes us, but uh, basically a lot more people who basically propose things. They may have experience, maybe it's internal in a company, and they push things through, and they want to get the change done. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't do these things, if you don't do some of the changes, people also complain and say, oh, you're not doing anything. So it's kind of a little bit a two-sided thing. On the one hand, we want to have experience. On the other hand, people also want to get changes done, and there's often nothing around which actually is of the shape or form we would like to use. That does sometimes include boost. Not everything in is the right way as we would expect it in boost. Just to give you an example, RAII is C++ existing practice since ages. Maybe as, as long as you are old. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and, and the thing is, uh, since we got destructors, so, and that's quite a long time. Yeah. And the thing is, we don't have, we have one or a couple of RAI classes, but not a general facility for people to reuse. And what I learned, even though we have, it's easy to think, okay, we want that, it's very hard to specify it in a way that it works as a standard class. And uh, just to give you, and so you might, want to standardize existing practice, but the existing practice is in a way that you actually cannot standardize it. So it always, when, when a proposal or a feature or a library that is well used hits the standard committee, it will be changed. So we always are standardizing stuff that might not, no, might not have been as long around as we would like it to be. So that's and if you want to have Boost HANA in the standard, write a proposal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, just you've touched on the, some of the three things I was going to say. First of all, we love Boost, but we don't, from the very beginning, we were sensitive to not give the impression that it was the only or the preeminent place that you had to go through Boost if you wanted to leg up. We don't want to create that impression. It was before GitHub, but hey, we have GitHub. There are a lot of implementations that, that come through from different places. Uh, certainly, Boost is a good place to get uh, early review to have a, a, a chance for higher quality, which will help get th things through um, and remove, remove obstacles. That's one thing. The second thing, not all things are appropriate to go through Boost. I can't imagine standardizing the parallelism TS, which is a library through Boost, which also requires some compiler support in some cases. So it, 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 it's not a, the, a one vehicle fits all um, uh, situation, but it's one of, of many inputs. And as, as far as standardizing existing practice, the third thing I would say is uh, we can over-index on that. Yes, we shouldn't go and be way too inventive and, and wild and crazy and, oh, I bet this would work. Let's just standardize it. Let, you know, we've, we did that some in the 1990s. But standardizing existence, existing practice does not mean slavishly saying, is there an exact implementation for this proposal? It means saying, have the risky parts been proven? Mm -hmm. And do we know enough about the interface that with the experience of the people looking at it, that they were confident that, yeah, that interface should work. And then we can try it out and fine tune it as, in, as it goes out for comment ballots and that kind of thing. So not to be too slavish about it, but also your point's well taken not to disregard it either. We want to be rooted in reality, but not rooted to the ground. Um, I'll sit down and say something. Uh, the other point is that we have got the technical specification, the TS route. So there are things where we have questions we want to get answers to before something becomes part of the international standard. Um, and we think we know how it should look. So you come up with a, a TS, and then people can implement that, and it makes it possible for people to get budget, for example, out of their company to develop that, because it is an official published document and not just a kind of a nice thought we might do. But then we can attempt to look at the response to people who play with it, and then feed that back in. I mean, the same thing happened with TR1, with the library. Um, how many people used TR1 when it was available? those who were using C++ back in those days. What eventually got standardized wasn't the whole of TR1. 
a few things didn't get standardised at that point. And what got standardised wasn't identical to TR1 because we learnt things. We had feedback from usage that said, this doesn't work, this doesn't interoperate. So we do have another option. We're still feeling our way as to what the best things are to put in a TS because the other flip side of putting it in a TS is some people can't use it because it's a TS and not part of the IS. So you fail to get the experience you're looking for. Uh, but that is a mechanism that we are making use of. I also want to point out some of the more contentious things where they actually did not standardize existing practice. We didn't standardize existing practice because actually there were lots of variations of uh, practice around. For example, uh, optional. Many people had their own optional or variant. Many people had their own variant. Maybe the boost variant was actually superior to many of them in many respects, but it didn't cover all of that. As far as I understand it, there were basically a number of issues other variants addressed which that didn't address, and all that getting folded ended up being standardized on something which actually didn't see as much existing practice as we would have liked. I have a, a related question, if I could briefly get two quick shows of hands. Um, I have two questions. Feel free to vote yes on both of them, um, or, or either or both or neither. <laughs> so the first one is, how many of you sometimes think the standardization, because of some of the machinery we've just been talking about in the process, how many of you have felt sometimes the standardization is too slow? Okay. How many of you, th so most people raised their hands, how many of you have felt sometimes the standardi standardization was too fast, it caused adoption problems? Fewer hands, but not that much fewer. So there's, there's a balance. We, I, I hear complaints that we're going too fast. How can I adopt this next standard? We're still inhaling the last one, or my compiler keeps adding new features. So, and it, it, the answer to that will vary from company to company, from consumer to consumer. So it's a balancing act when you're serving a diverse community of, I have to change this number every year now. Last I heard is four and a half million developers around the world in all sorts of industries. So it's a juggling, a balancing act. So I'm glad that that not to dis that we got lots of hands for both of those questions, so we're probably right ar around where we should be. A different question. I'd, I'd like to ask a different question, actually. You know, for during this during the last few years, we published uh, um, several TSs. I'm going to ask about one in particular. Um, we published two versions of the Library Fundamentals TS, which contained things like String View and Optional and Any and um, the, the Boyer Moore searchers and a, a bunch of other stuff. And I'm just curious about how many people uh, actually used those um, as opposed to waiting to see what was going to be in C17. Those would be standard experimental this and that and the other thing. So just see a show of hands. Well, yeah, besides me. Okay, not very many people out there. I saw, I think, four hands. I had a comment and now I've forgotten what it was. <laughs> I, I think one of the problems is that there are areas of software development where you are required to use a standard. And the problem with that is that every time we will release a new standard, the previous one ceases to be valid. But there is no such thing as a standard C++ 11 on a standard, as of the release of standard of the 17 version, there will no longer be such a thing as a standard C++ 14. Industries which are not constrained by being required to use a standard will just continue to use the switches in their compilers that allows them to use 11 or 14. And the advice I give to developers is, if you're using, for example, C++ 11 for your company pr production, future-proof yourself against moving on by after you have compiled the current version, recompile it with a switch, switch to 14, because that will alert you as to whether there is any problem that will occur when you eventually do move to C++ 14, even though the company policy is to continue to use C++ 11. Um, but yes, I think the difficulty with rapid change is 
the problem to the company that, or the industry, the security industry or whatever it is, where you're required to use the current standard and that can, can be quite expensive for them. Um, I, I don't, I didn't really hear a question there, but I'm going to, I'm going to make a, a comment anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and that is that, that I would feel very bad for someone who would, who, who would be required to use C++11 as it was published in 2011. Um, we, we process defect reports all the time, every meeting. Things that were specified poorly, specified incorrectly in the standard, things that were fundamentally broken, and you know these get rolled up into the next standard, you know, say C++14 or C++17, but implementations will go and fix them, even though they do not match what is the public standard, and so somebody who for some reason is required to use C++11 directly as is specified in the document you get from, you used to be able to get from ISO, um, is kind of, kind of stuck. I don't think that actually happens, but I think I, I hope not. <laughs> where they use C++11. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, the latest fixed up C++11, but they're not ready to move across to C++14. Mm -hmm. And I do understand that because every uh, commercial organization has got a considerable investment in training. If they have any sense, they've got a considerable <coughs> investment in training. And the three-year releases do, in actual fact, stress the training budgets uh, for some companies, and it depends upon the economic state uh, as to how much they c it gets stressed. Of course, I'm one of those people who believes that during a recession, companies should be investing in training because there isn't any market for the pr stuff that they're producing. <laughs> so they might as well get themselves ready for when the recession goes away. But that's my view of uh, the world as a whole. And the why I think many companies are wrong. They, they release their programmers, and unfortunately, uh, when they're declaring redundancy, quite a few of them have policies by which they can't just declare Joe re redundant. They have to say, uh, we need to have a 10% cut in staff who volunteers. And unfortunately, the people who volunteer are often uh, the Andrew Koenigs of this world. <laughs> They're the ones who believe they won't have any trouble getting another job. Yes. Yeah. Another question? Thank you. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's an undercurrent of thinking that C17 in its current state was a bit not as powerful, not as like a shaker and mover like the other versions were. Like, I think even Bjarni was a bit disappointed with some of the things that slipped through. Well, are you guys ready at this point to kind of have a mini post-mortem? Do you think, did you learn from this? Like, how will be the next version? Will it have, like, more? Are you aiming for that? Are you afraid it will be too much ingestion? Are you going to have everything, like modules, contracts, everything? So, yes, some were disappointed. In particular, <laughs> when we switched from a ship whenever we're ready and that usually takes multiple years longer than we thought model, which we did twice, to a ship every three years, whatever is ready model, one of the angsting that goes on is people get faced with the reality of, oh, you know what, stuff that isn't ready doesn't ship. You get to pick the feature set or you get to pick when you ship, you, 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 and you admit uncertainty in the other, you can't do both. So by shipping more regularly, one positive we've had is that compilers are far more in sync than ever before. Uh, C++14 was the first time we had a, a, a conforming, fully conforming compiler ship the same year as the standard. This year we expect to have multiple compilers ship fully conforming the same year as the standard. So that's good for one C++ for the industry. But we've also at the same time said we need to work on long pole features that don't fit into just three years. And so we've been doing that through TSs. So you specifically asked for module, about modules, and people mentioned coroutines. Those are going through TSs. If you look at what happened, what got into C17, it was pretty much every TS that had shipped 
before, uh, uh, at least one year before the feature cutoff for C++17. So just go to isocpp.org slash status where there's a graphic showing the progress of all the TSs and you will see a number of TSs that are done, they're shipped, and there's a few more that we're about to ship. Um, a very good guess as to what will be in C++20 is the, the ones that are done in the next 12 months and that ship in the next 12 months. That's not a certain guarantee, but it's what we have been doing. And it turns out that as we fill up that pipeline, it takes a while to fill up a pipeline. There's a, a, several big things that are done and waiting. And I know that people are, a lot of people in the committee are just are very anxious to get concepts in and look forward to getting a, a few more things in. And just look at that graphic and you can see where everything is. Just like when there's an open source project, you can look at the beta branches that have shipped and you know those are the ones that are going to be next ready to merge. So, um, and under the, under the uh, rubric of responsible opposing opinions, and you guys can decide if I'm being reasonable. Um, so, there have been people both inside and outside the committee who have expressed vocal public disappointment with the, the lack of new features in C++17. And I disagree. I think there's a lot of new things in C++17, but my bias is from the library side. Mm -hmm. We slotted in four very large chunks of functionality into the standard library. A whole set of parallel algorithms, a whole set of special math functions, an entire file system library, and a, a you know, the library fundamentals TS, not to mention a whole bunch of, um, uh, well, not to mention variant, which wasn't in any of those, and um, a bunch of other things. And so, um, from my point of view, this was a very, very big release. Um, what isn't in there are some, a bunch of things that, you know, were high profile um, language features that people were very interested in, so. I was quite surprised when various people started putting together lists of what's in C++17 and suddenly it became a lot of a bigger release than you realized because I think when you're working on it things once you've dealt with the paper it's just it's dealt with you kind of forget about it and then someone starts putting the list together so there's various lists out there Nico is, is producing on Nico Gisutis. Uh there's one that's more targeted at kind of people on the committee that uh, Thomas Cooper has done and there's been a couple of other blog postings about it uh, so while there are things it would have been nice if we'd managed to get them in. We did get quite a lot of things in. Uh, and there's three years' time, hopefully, there'll be another standard. Um, one of the things we are trying to do is to focus more explicitly on the big things we would like to see in the next standard. And so the next meeting and the meeting after that, uh, we're trying to make more deliberate effort to make sure that they get time and energy spent on them. Um, Some people need to remember history. Uh, the first version of C++ took a very long time, not least because trying to get templates right took a very long time. Had templates gone to a TS, the original C++ would have been shipped much earlier. Had templates gone to a TS, we might not have had all the problem of the export. So people need to remember that the pressure to ship early can create problems. With libraries, these are recoverable more easily. But if you change something in the core, it is extremely difficult to go back. And remember that export, I can remember Bill Plowger sitting somewhere in England telling us that we'd voted it in and we couldn't take it out again. And it didn't come out until the, the only company that had implemented it actually proposed to remove it. And I think that is a sane and sensible position. But people really do need to remember history. Yes, I want concepts. I want modules. But I don't want a broken version. Um. <coughs> How do you, uh, in your company or in your environment, train the complexity or the increased complexity of the language? 
Uh, I just remember a talk that uh, Nico did at the beginning of the conference where he uh, described uh, the problems of uh, making a class correctly in respect to uh, move semantics, for instance. I, I think I, I consider myself an expert in teaching people C++ because I have about one, uh, 80 to 100 each year. And the good thing is you don't have to teach all of the details of the language because the language became, let's say, more complex so you can write simpler code and being as efficient as if you would care. So I think the core guidelines and my how, how I, t I teach C++ by not, by relying on the compiler doing the right thing for you is the way how to teach it and it becomes simpler. If you want to write code on the level of you have to move deliberately or write move constructors, for example, for your own code, then you're doing something wrong and you should leave that to the expert like Marshall mm -hmm. or Dietmar mm -hmm. or whoever is around who might made m make mistakes and even they might make mistakes. So rely on the compiler, reduce what you actually use from the language and write better code and get better code generated for you fr by the compiler. So that's, that's my take on it. The language, actually, C++11 made it much simpler to use the language and the library. And, and 14 did more of that, and maybe when we get modules, it becomes more. I have personally, and I, I, I need to may maybe uh, get, a, get a little bit away from Daniel for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm very, let's say, excited and afraid of what concepts will actually bring <laughs> us in the usability <laughs> of the language. Mm -hmm. Because the original thing where concepts were about getting better compiler error messages, we got them without having concepts not right now. At least for some things. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really excited what we will get. And as of today, I would say the more modern features and under the hood, more complexity of the language and the library actu actually makes it much easier to use. Uh, I would. <laughs> yeah, well, but, but I, and I would just add to that. So there are, there are making something more complex means there's more to teach if you teach it all. If you teach some new things, you can stop teaching some old things. Bjarne has railed for decades about people who teach C first, then C++. Mm. There are people who still teach old C++ before new C++, and it's the same principle. Um, so when do, I, I'll, I'll talk about this a bit later on this afternoon, about when does adding a language feature make the language simpler. Language is bigger, but code is simpler. It's when you add abstraction, and there's two kinds you can add. You can add an abstraction built into the language, and that is something like a range four that takes a coding pattern, and just you just don't have to write the pattern anymore. And it declared it. You can declare your intent. User's code got simpler. Language got bigger. Sure, there's another another page, but the user's code got simpler. But the the biggest one, which is a very rare beast, is if you can add a new abstraction mechanism. That is a new way for people to author abstractions, meaning and especially encapsulated abstractions that have an interface that hide implementation so they could ship it as a library. How many of those mechanisms does C++ have today? Two. Mm -hmm. Templates is a parameterization of both of them. Functions mm -hmm. and classes. That's all we have, and we have lots of variations. We have overloading for functions, but that's a hardwired language feature in the first category to give you convenient, a convenient way to express something, but it's not an abstraction boundary that you can hide an implementation behind. The function itself is. Uh, templates are a great way to parameterize functions. For the same reason, concepts is in that category because absolutely very useful, but it's, uh, it's more in the, the simplifying. If we can find language features that let you write new kinds of user-defined abstractions, and there is one already on its way to a TS, the third one in C++'s history, in my opinion, would be modules, because that is the first language feature that we would have added since classes that is a new abstraction boundary, where there's an interface and hides implementation. 
And it is that that is the reason why people are finding, hey, wait, if I have modules, you know, besides the things that the feature itself gives you, like faster builds and encapsulation and, or uh, macro isolation, things like that, they're discovering, oh, but I can, it unblocks other things, like perhaps package management for libraries and things like that. But why? Because it's letting people write a new abstraction as a library without invading their compiler. So that's the kind of thing that would really stand to simplify C++ even more going forward. Uh, yes, it's a response to uh, what Peter said. Uh, I agree on if you are pure, well, pure application developer, but when you start to developing in your own environment uh, libraries so that they get reused, I think for those it's, was, it's more difficult than uh, before. Uh, he's, he, he's nodding and he's agreeing. I agree. There is a difference between the person who is writing code fresh and the new versions that make that much, much easier. Uh, I have a book out there, an old book now, in which the word pointer doesn't occur anywhere in the text. I know because I did a textual search before I let the book be published. There are no pointers. Of course there are pointers. They're hidden away where the reader doesn't need to know about them. And that's an important feature for much high-level coding, is that the difficult, awkward, low-level stuff gets hidden away but if you're a maintenance programmer, every addition to C++ makes it harder for you. Because when you're trying to look at legacy code, you have to understand code which is written in a style and written, written using features that the new programmer knows nothing about. That's why I create tools to get rid of the old features and replace them by the new ones. Yes. That's, that's my main motivation for, for having a, a, a build an IDE and providing refactoring and, and automatic correction for that. Yeah. And yeah, for the first time, in, at least in my career of writing C++, is we have automated tools to help with that instead of doing it by hand. Um, you know, um, not, not just yours, but other ones too, but yeah, but that's okay. Um, multiple <laughs> ones. Um, but no, the, the point is, is that it is easier to take code, code written in idioms that, it, that are no longer common in C++ and update them to uh, more current practice than it ever, ever has been. And my take is, if you write libraries, and it's not the standard library where you might need to deal with idiosyncrasies of your users. And if you write libraries for, you, let's say, for a local user community, I'm not saying if you write libraries like Boost where you might have users that go all around the world and have interesting compilers and interesting compiler settings and interesting styles of using it. But if you, let's say, have are writing libraries for an overseeable amount of, of users, you can stick with a lot of modern things without needing to actually deal with the underlines. And so, writing your own move constructor is a very, very rare case that you actually need to do. And if you're there, call me in for a code review and I might be able to show you how to get rid of it. Or make it right, depending. <laughs> Uh, if I'm writing a container and I'm trying to do the right thing and look at the allocator traits, uh, which tells me that I should not propagate the allocator on container swap, uh -huh. um, and I then test the allocators and determine that they don't match, I'm unable to provide a non-throwing swap as far as I can tell. Uh, so my question is twofold. Um, firstly, am I doing it wrong? Or secondly, if I'm not doing it wrong, is there anything in the standardization process that's coming that will help this situation to get any better? Oh, oh joy. <laughs> the, you want to answer? Go ahead. the fundamental allocator model is allocators stay where they are on assignment, on swap. You do not move them. That indeed means you 
don't have a non-throwing swap. Uh, you may have an, um, a swap which may throw, potentially. In practice, the swap actually normally does not throw because you normally do swap only within corresponding ranges. And actually, uh, f specifically for vector, because uh, possibly the other containers as well, we actually made the decision to, uh, or because it actually it's bad for vector of strings, for example, we make the conscious decision that, uh, if I recall correctly, is it right? The swap is actually declared as no throw mm -hmm. and no accept. Um, no accept. So okay. although it in theory could have to allocate uh, memory, it's still called no accept. In the end, the reasoning, and this is basically the case where you would actually have to throw because we try to allocate memory, but it's not there, and we have different allocators, that's why we do, do that. That case, in practice, actually does not happen. So the, the decision was, was actually to say, we accept that. That's a hmm? It's an accepted Bloomberg. Well, yeah, Bloomberg didn't accept that, but uh, <laughs> th th that's, a, that's a separate discussion. That's, this is our own company internal stuff, and we have our own implementation anyway, so whatever. But um, actually, technically, what the standard library does is if you try to swap two containers that have different allocators, we just say that that's undefined behavior. Um, you don't have to do that. You could, in fact, you know, had mark your throw your swap as not no accept and and do all the work. But um, the 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 people who who wrote the standard library clauses said, you know, no, we don't want to go there. Um, because we have other requirements. The swap is not, for example, swap on the standard library containers is not allowed to invalidate any references or iterators or anything. You just end up with references into the other container or iterators into the other container. And if you had to, basically, if you had to make copies of all the elements of the container with the new allocator to do a swap, that would, you would end up with you know, iterators that had been invalidated, references that had been invalidated. And I don't want to, I'm going to use the passive voice here. It was felt that. <laughs> Is that the passive aggressive voice? Yes, there you go. <laughs> it was felt that, that preserving the, um, the iter iterator and reference invalidation rules was more important than defining how swap would work in containers with different allocators. The question is, why are you writing your own containers and not just wrappers to the existing ones? Sometimes the existing ones don't do what I need them to do. So there's no ring in the standard library, for example. <laughs> then propose it. <laughs> <laughs> And actually, I entirely disagree with his position of don't write containers. Mm -hmm. In fact, we go to great lengths to make it possible for users to write containers to meet their special need. Mm. This is, I would claim, the vast majority of the benefit of how the C++ standard library is done is to exactly enable that. And people, if you do it, however, that is a non-trivial task, and you need to know quite a bit of uh, things. I teach my students on how to write a bounded buffer in the advanced C++ course. So it's, I was a little bit of joking, but very often people think they need to write something which is actually there. So that's why I was asking. If you have a real reason, yes. The problem is many books start out with, oh, this is how you implement vector. I, <laughs> and, and I know at least of one very popular one, which is now in its fifth incantation, that starts out with the first class that you're shown how to write is vector. And that's not what you should do, regardless how good you are, mm -hmm. unless you're called Marshall or <laughs> Dietmar. <laughs> I think you, you, you would like not to have to write vector, vector anymore. Bool. Vector bool, I don't want to have to write <laughs> Just as a personal opinion, I would like it if, if we made it easier for people to write containers. The container requirements are 
baroque maybe is a good word. Um, no, no, not broken, but it's just <laughs> baroque. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, not clear. Ornate. Ornate is also a good word. But um, in any case, I would like it if it was much easier to write containers because there are a lot of containers out there for that that have some of which are general purpose, some of which are special purpose, and being able to write you know containers in the stand, in the spirit of the standard library is, I think, an important thing to be able to do. I mean, we have thirteen something like that. You know, I'd be I. I'd be happy if there were 50 or 60 of them, not necessarily all of them in the standard library, but you know, that, that people could pick and choose and get a container that was very closely matched to the ones that, um, you know, the, their uses. You know, Boost Container Library has some of them. Um, if you go browsing through the LLVM source code, you will find they have another dozen that, that are various, various special use containers, and that's a great thing. So it was mentioned that as we keep adding new features, the language gets more complex, uh, you know, more, more complex. And um, that also impacts our ability, I think, to add new features to the language because we need to b uh, preserve backwards compatibility. Uh, and while this is very important because we have, you know, for some something, you know, uh, million users, um, is there any desire to uh, eventually start deprecating not library level not library features, but actual language level features. Yes. <laughs> We've done some. So right now, the, the, tr the, the, the curve of how frequently we do that is increasing. It's still near zero, but it's, but, it's, but it's bending upwards. So who knows where that will go? But we have, in fact, deprecated language features and even uh, out, uh, banned previous language features. To give you auto, we took away implicit, uh, implicit int and, and auto and other things that it meant. But we have not deprecated anything which caused any of the real problems. We, we, we have template export. Not, not a real problem. So we, we actually deprecated a language feature that I'm pretty sure you've never used. So yeah. did you, how many people know that, you could, that before C++17 that you could increment a bool? You could say plus plus b, where b is a bool. Right, <laughs> not in 17. We also got rid of the register key, 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 keyword, but we left it as a key, key, keyword. And there is already a proposal which has gra grabbed it back. <laughs> I don't know if it will succeed, but. <laughs> yeah, and it gave rise to the, the wonderful section in the, uh, in the standard called zombie.names. There's a, in the C++17, there's a standard named zombie names, and they're, they're titled, these are identifiers reserved for previous standardization. <laughs> Time travel thing, sure. <laughs> <laughs> things that things that used to be keywords or used to be reserved names in the standard library, and no, we're not giving them back. <laughs> Other question? Um, how likely is it that Howard Hinnett's date library will get incorporated into C++ at some point? <laughs> Well, interestingly enough, we were, we were in a talk yesterday and somebody asked me, what, what is your favorite C++ library that's not in the standard? And I said, that one. Um, how likely? I don't know. I know Howard is going to propose it for standardization. I know that there are people working for um, certain, large, certain large software houses who I don't see anybody from that software house here who have a different vision of how a date library should work. And so they're liable to, there's liable to be some pushback, but um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a really nice library, and um, I hope it ends up in the standard. Date is one of the cases where there's a lot of usage out there, mm -hmm. and there's conflicting usage out there, mm -hmm. and it will be a fight because in the end we will have, if we ever get a date, it will be one name of a date, and it will, not match most of the other dates, just saying. If there was, just in general, what should be standardized? 
not things that are too narrow, but things that are of general broad use. Doesn't mean that everybody may use them, but that you know, it's not just for, for one, uh, one domain, but especially things that are hard to write. How many of you have written your own date or time related classes? Oh, most. Uh -huh. so, so, how many? So, how many? So that's a problem right there. How many of them have known bugs? <laughs> Notice I didn't say had known bugs. I said have known bugs, and almost the same number of hands went up. My my comment was: Have all you people who have written date libraries, and and yes, I'm one of them. How many of them use the word proleptic in your comments? <laughs> Proleptic calendars. <laughs> it's like, ah, it's like I got down there and I looked at this word and I said, oh, wow, there's a whole bunch more I don't know about. <laughs> there's a 10 minute YouTube video that's, I, I, f I forget who did it, but it was very entertaining about someone who went through trying to write a daytime library because when it got, when it was, it was useful. So people started using it and sending in bug reports about things that didn't work. And it was just case after case after case. And the whole video was titled something like, why you do not want to ever write your own date and time library. Proleptic mm -hmm. Gregorian calendar. Oh. <laughs> Another question? So there are many uh, special groups, I think they're called, in mm -hmm. the standardization stuff, like th I think 14 mm -hmm. now. Um, so my question is, do you think there's anything else that's missing in terms of a special group? I don't know if there's one for serialization. Maybe there is. Um, and also, what do you think is uh, the most exciting things coming out of the SGs, whether it's reflection or low latency or um, whatever? Very briefly, there are currently 14. We spin up more as there's a big domain that needs some incubation before there's an initial proposal. Um, how only, a little less than half of those are active right now because the others have done their work. To me, the most uh, interesting thing besides modules, which is now out of SGs, to come in uh, that's, that's just transitioning out of an SG is reflection, which just got broadened to compile time programming. <laughs> I think they're missing uh, SGs. I'm not necessarily able to name name them. I'm sure there are uh, communities who would like to have things in there. Uh, the problem is, however, finding people who actually are sufficiently interested to drive things. For example, there was a uh, database mm -hmm. uh, um, SG created. I'm sure a lot of people have interest in, in the database area. Um, that, that thing never really lived off, partly, I think, because of their charter, which was along the lines of, oh, we want to get that thing standardized. And a lot of people interested in that space said, well, that is exactly what we don't want, <laughs> and uh, not enough uh, interest. So this is one of the problems uh, in that space, but I think there are lots of SGs kind of missing. And database area, I think, should be better covered. One thing that's missing and hard to do is units. Mm. Another question, sir. Okay, you finished on mm -hmm. the Happy? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very specific kind of question, I guess. Um, so I guess as you are all as well, I'm very excited about reflection. Um, that's, I think, one of the cool things that are happening right now. And I've looked into it, and I think one of the things for this and other things that are really, could be really useful that are not there are like efficient compile time strings. Um, is that something that you know anyone's working on or would be actually interesting in, like in a broader sense? Um, so I'm not 100% sure what you're looking for with efficient compile time strings. I just will point out to you that you can make string views in C++17 at compile time from literal constants. And those give you most of what you want if you don't want to actually modify the strings. Yeah, uh, the reflection guys use things like stood int integral sequence and things like that, mm -hmm. which is a bit ugly. So a bit ugly, but no, in C++17 you say quote A, B, C, D, quote S, V. You get a string view. That's a container. You can't modify it, but you can run iterators on it. You can, you can call member functions on it. 
you can pass them to algorithms, things like that. I think what, what you are uh, asking for is using compile time strings to create names. Yeah, or, or at compile time. Yeah, as a te like, a, like a template argument, yeah. Uh, that's something I know people work on, but I, but it's it's not really. Maybe Herb might might know more. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not what you said. Yeah, I'm aware of what you said. That's not solving the problem, but. Yes, a number of us are working on it, and that overlaps with my talk this afternoon. Other question? Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, w what is compile time programming, or whatever it is that you mentioned when you said that reflection SG was extended? Is it? The man on your left? Yes. <laughs> 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 Hello. <laughs> He's compile time programming. <laughs> so um, basically, we are looking at the different ways that we can have a computational, computationally complete mechanism for doing programming, uh, well, at compile time. So uh, the mainly we, we see three things right now. First one is classic template metaprogramming, as we all know from the Boost MPL and stuff like that. The other one is um, kind of HANA style uh, metaprogramming where you manipulate things as with an object syntax, with a usual C++ syntax, but uh, th your sequences are tuples, and, and all the objects that you manipulate still have a, a, a heterogeneous types. And the third one, which I personally believe is the future, is where <coughs> we just extend constexpr so that it allows us to, to manipulate types um, using uh, something that I presented at, at the end of my talk, but um, like compile time type information, essentially. Uh, so we're, we're looking essentially right now at, at the different ways that we can uh, do computations on, t on types. And the trade-offs there are like usability, uh, our ability to reuse current tools, and also obviously uh, compile time efficiency. <laughs> uh, and then what we have to do is obviously bridge this with reflection and the ability, so the ability to extract information from the, from the program and then the ability to influence the program back after having transformed you know, this information. And uh, these two parts are, I, I believe, going to be addressed by uh, Herb's talk. Another question? L let me just set expectations. There's one slide that summarizes, assume you have reflection and, and, and compile time programming. The rest of the talk simply assumes their existence and builds another layer on top. So I'm actually not going to explain them. I'm just going to assume them. Assume again. Well, then I'm going to ask a question of people in turn. If it just goes along from one end to the other, which is, what's the thing you're most looking forward to with C++ 17? If, if you've got one, you may not have one. Apart from job done, perhaps from Marshall's point of view. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what are you looking forward to most down the line with C20 or beyond? So is the question 17 or 20 now? Both. Both? Yeah. What are you looking forward to actually happening when you can use C17 and what are you looking forward to for the future? I would say for 20 is getting RAII into because <laughs> then it's out of my. Uh, away from my plate, so that's, that's something I, I want to, mm -hmm. to have digested into the standard, and not getting it into the standard would be horrible. Uh, for 17, I have another dimension, getting the language features into our IDE, and that's a, tough, a lot mm -hmm. of work yeah. still. For 17, the feature I'm... Um, I'm most interested, uh, more happy is the parallel STL. I still think we can I improve and extend the pa parallel STL, but it's a, a wonderful uh, first step to bring parallelism uh, to many people that otherwise would have many difficulties in making use of it. Uh, and uh, for 20, I'm not going to surprise you, Peter, my <laughs> top 
one goal is having finally concepts in the language. <laughs> it's the most important thing that we need. And many other things need concepts to be built on top of that. 17 stru uh, stru uh, structured bi uh, bindings. Uh, we added it to the comp compiler. I went into the dev responsible and told him to up update the tools we used to build the compiler straight away so I could remove all uses of std tie within our comp comp compiler, which mm -hmm. I did. Uh, 20, uh, I'm working on this already, con con concepts, it's really nice. It's actually, we now have a, our compiler is now getting close to being what you'd call a real comp comp compiler, <laughs> and that makes the con concepts easy to Im easier to Im implement, mm -hmm. so. Unsurprising, I echo what uh, and uh, Danny said uh, about the parallel algorithms, that is, I talked about that so over here at the presentation. Uh, for C20, I think modules are the thing I'm most interested. Um, so, Roger nailed it for me. I mean, the, the most important, the, the biggest thing for me for 17 will be when I can put stamp done on my library and say, okay, it's complete, I've shipped it. But uh, structured bindings looks like it's going to be very interesting, and it's going to change the way that people um, write code. It make, makes multi-return functions just mm -hmm. much, much easier. Yeah. On the other hand, I will kind of miss STD unused. I found, I found all sorts of interesting places to use it. Um, for 20, I don't know. I'm just, I'm watching. I'm sure there's going to be a whole bunch of new library things. Um, concepts and ranges, basically, are, are a really nice pair of things. And I'm really looking forward to playing with a ranges implementation. On Thursday, I rather unwisely exposed myself to live coding in front of Peter. <laughs> <laughs> it was the hardest presentation of my life. Um, one of the big mistakes I made was to return a tuple from a function. And in fairness, this is at 12.30 in the morning, the night before, as I was frantically trying to get the wretched thing finished. And I, I just grabbed the first thing that came to mind. Um, structured bindings, please, would, would have, you know, the, 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 the appropriate way to do it would be to make, you know, declare a struct for the sole purpose of returning something from that function and then referencing that, which just makes me ache a little because it seems unnecessary. And structured bindings solves that. I'm really looking forward to that. C++ 20, modules. Oh my effing G. I am <laughs> the Total War code base <laughs> is a massive, massive piece of work and I spend a disproportionate amount of my time, considering I'm a games programmer, not doing any games programming, but actually waiting for the wretched thing to compile mm -hmm. or trying to make the thing compile faster. I'm hoping for a step change. I tell you what, if I don't get a step change with modules, I'm gonna come to your houses individually <laughs> <laughs> with the team and, and you can make us dinner, all right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that ended much better than I was afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I, had to, I, had to, I had to edit. I really did have to edit that ending. <laughs> I can pick one thing from 17 and one thing for 20 because I love many things and not mentioning them does not, does not disparage anything else. I'm looking forward to many things. For 17, structured bindings. For, for 20, modules. Well, thank you all for your questions, Roger, and you the question? oh, I, I hadn't thought of that. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, one little thing I'm really looking forward to is the simple one of initializers in an if. Mm -hmm. So you can go now if initializer semicolon condition, and it just has the whole thing of reducing scope of temporary variables. Same with while. Same with yeah, same with other things, but I think if is the one I'm going to use it most in. Um, for 20, uh, having done a couple of presentations, one here last year and one at ACU Oxford on concepts, uh, I really want them. It makes life a lot easier, but particularly uh, implementing things that are currently are done with an overload, with an able if, and it just becomes so much easier for the user to use them safely without getting ambiguity problems or seeing all the scaffolding appear. So I'd like to say thank you very much to everyone for your questions. Oh, Francis has got a question or a comment. 
I'm interested in the fact that about half the people were looking forward to concepts and about half looking forward to modules. And I wonder if the difference is that concepts are a fantastic thing for library writers <laughs> and modules are a fantastic thing for the end programmer. Sounds like discussion over a beer or lunch. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to say thank you very much to my victims. I mean the, uh, the, the team for agreeing to stand. Thank you.